Okay, good morning or afternoon, depending when I'm seeing you. We are going to use the uh, last section of the, the last part of the uh, Nature of Science chapter of the book is applying all we've talked about into a case study. In this case, it's the Minneapolis Bridge failure of uh, 2007. So we're going to apply this, the concept we've talked about in the scientific method, nature of science, and the um, measurement unit uh, to an actual real-life case study. So the Minneapolis Bridge failure uh, back in August 1st of 2007, what happened in the morning is just a center section of the Interstate 35 West Bridge in North Minneapolis, Minnesota, suddenly gave way on August 1st, 2007. So if you can see, it kind of buckled here and it buckled there. So just part of the bridge just collapsed. Uh, now that was a surprise, obviously, because when a bridge is built, they go through very uh, stringent design and engineering processes. They have to go through permits. They have to go through engineering uh, and development uh, simulations to see what kind of stresses they can hold, uh, material uh, checks to make sure that the materials will hold up in the weather climate because Minneapolis uh, will adjust pretty quickly to the weather because it's very cold in the winter. So all those things were probably accounted for when they did have the design for the bridge and when they built the bridge. So for when the bridge to collapse like that, it leads to the purpose of why they did a scientific inquiry or investigation is basically answer the question, why did the bridge collapse? Now, just to bring our memory of what a controlled experiment is, remember, uh, for anything we answer, any, kind of, any series of skills or steps that we use to answer a question is scientific inquiry, and that was back in our last test. Um, and just reminding you about experiments, a type of scientific investigation that, that tests how one factor affects another is called a controlled experiment. We talked about the controlled group, the, in the experimental group, the independent variable, dependent variable. So anytime we're doing an experiment, we would do a controlled experiment and have all those factors accounted for. Um, now, anything that an experiment that can have more than one value, whether it's math or science, we call that a variable. Why? Because it can vary. Uh, the factor in the experiment that is changed or manipulated by the scientist is the uh, sorry, is the independent variable, also known as the manipulated variable. It's the one thing the scientist changes. Uh, the factor that we measured based on the uh, independent variable is the dependent variable because it depends on the independent variable. If this all sounds very familiar, it's because it is. We just studied this a couple weeks ago. Now, all the factors in the experiment that uh, do not change are called the controls. Uh, so if we uh, particularly the controls of the experiment, well, things have to be kept the same, like age, gender, level, fitness. If we're talking about a health, exp uh, health experiment or anything like that, we have to have take these factors into consideration. And we have to make sure that we have constants. Remember that when we have data, we have both qualitative and quantitative data. Qualitative describes a quality of the object, like it's slow or it's red or it's uh, ambiguous or confusing or awkward. Those are very ambiguous and confusing qualitative observations, by the way. Uh, and then remember, quantitative, they are all numbers. Any quantitative value would have a number to it, a quantity. Uh, the part of the control group that we are, the part of the experiment that we give the independent variable group, uh, independent experiment. Variable two, sorry, is called the experimental group or the test group. Uh, the group that contains the same factors as the experimental group but the independent variable does not change is called the control group. So anytime we are comparing it to, we are, uh, it's a control group. So it's a group, uh, it's the old soap we're comparing the new soap to. It's the group that gets the placebo, not the actual medicine. Now, back to this, the case study here. We're discussing bridges a little bit. So the simplest kind of bridge that they can build is a beam bridge. And you kind of just see these. Um, if you cross in Rawson Bridge, that's a beam bridge where they have supports in the water. And then the, the bridge kind of just goes across those supports and onto the land. That is a beam bridge. Um, now, one thing about a beam bridge is that if you do have them too long, uh, you can get problems where the live load, which we'll talk about in a little bit, can start to actually cause the bridge to sag. If we see here that this part of the bridge, probably the ground or anything started to sink or, or, or curve, and this bridge actually has a curve to it. And I can't imagine that's a good thing for a bridge. Uh, so to go over a larger expanse or if they have to build bridges a different support way, they might use a truss bridge. A truss bridge, now you've crossed over these, if you're across the border between Illinois and Kentucky or uh, Illinois and anything, any longer span bridge, you're going to have a truss bridge. And the truss is really these triangles, and 
engineering from an engineering standpoint, these triangles are really strong supportive structures, much stronger. Now, uh, if we get to it, we'll do the building bridge project. If not, um, uh, it's unfortunate. But if you build a bridge with triangles, it disperses the weight a lot more evenly. And you can hold a lot more weight on it. And that is called a truss or a triangle. Now, the I-35 bridge was a truss bridge. We can see that we have all these triangles in the support of the bridge itself. There are some supports into the water, but the actual problem was in the trusses themselves. Oops. Uh, the beams in the bridge's deck and the triangular and vertical supports come together at structures known as gusset plates. You will not be asked this on a test. But all these beams that we have, they come together with these big steel plates, and you can see all these bolts that they have in them. Those are called gusset plates, and they kind of hold all the bridge together. So all these beams and all these support structures are really supported by this gusset plate that kind of hold it all together. If you ever did connects, it's the connecting pieces. Those all look the other other pieces connect to those are really important so in this case those were known as gusset plates um and again you're not, you're not gonna have a bridge engineering test but please uh don't panic but we also called the area where the truss structures connect to the uh portion of the road those are called nodes okay so anywhere where the uh is attached to the ground at the end of one of those triangles is called a node but you know that <laughs> sorry all right, bridge failure. So what they noticed about the I-35 West Bridge, when they looked at the bridge itself and they examined why the collapse occurred, um, they had noticed a couple of things. One thing, that they were doing construction on the bridge at the time, and they noticed that, that the construction crews had actually unintentionally damaged part of the bridge, which is going to weaken its structure. Um, so the investigators eventually recovered the entire structure. So just like in a plane crash, one thing they do is they take all the pieces they can find, all the pieces they can gather, and they kind of lay it out the way it was naturally so they can see locations where problems would occur. If you've ever seen a video where they have a plane, all the pieces of a plane after a plane crash laid out in a hangar, uh, they're really trying to put together what occurred. They're using it for, for forensic to see kind of what uh, where the problem started and where it occurred. Um, now, they also used um, there was a, a security camera across the street uh, and it actually caught the uh, collapse itself. So if you watch the camera, it's going to cycle here. But here it's together. By seeing, you see how it kind of breaks there and there. And you can see the nodes where it breaks. So this video is also another piece of uh, information or uh, observational data for the investigators to use to kind of see, oh, yeah, okay, it breaks here, it breaks here. So what's the investigate what was there that may have caused that break? So that's all science is. Again, we're asking questions. So investigators studied the various questions to determine why the bridge collapsed or if it was a combination of things that caused it to fail. Uh, when they're looking at bridges, they're talking about a dead load. The dead load is basically just the weight of the bridge itself. A bridge is a very heavy um, structure. It's got a lot of concrete. It's got a lot of steel in it. Um, the weight of the bridge does put some load on the bridge itself. That is called the dead load. So like your beams and girders, your concrete, your asphalt, your railings, anything that's up there, any signs are going to add weight to the dead load, which is going to put stress on the bridge. A live load is things that move or change or uh, a wind gust, earthquake. Oops, sorry. Darn it. Uh, like the train. For the, for the most of the time, the dead load is just the bridge itself. But in the moments when the bridge is the train is crossing the bridge, that becomes a live load, and that does, does add stresses to the bridge as well. For qualitative data, we use things like uh, qualities, colors, textures, smells. Like if I was talking about the bridge, well, it bent or it rusted. Those are qualitative observations. If I'm going to look at talk about, talk about the live load or dead load that was on the bridge, those would be numbers, and that would be quantitative data. So after they did all the modeling, all the analysis, the investigators ruled out that the bridge failed because it was overloaded. That there were these construction trucks on the on the uh, bridge. You can see them here. But they said, okay, well, that wasn't the problem. They should have been able to hold that kind of load. Uh, but they, then they noticed what, where the failures occurred were at these gusset plates. These are the first things to have failed. So what they looked at to see, okay, well, why would these things have failed first? Uh, they couldn't determine if the undersized plate. Now, what they determined was that these plates were not as thick as they were supposed to be. They were supposed to be a certain thickness of metal, and they weren't. They weren't because, sure because it was a mistaken calculation in the, in the design process. 
if it was a drafting error or a construction process. But what actually caused the bridge to fail was these little metal plates here um, that were too thin. So, as you can see, we took the scientific method, we applied it to a case study, just as they would in a natural uh, a situation. So that is the uh, notes. What your homework will be for today will be to look at the um, PBS uh, it's, um, um, bridge kind of simulation activity. There will be no assigned work for it, but I do want you to play around with it and, and sort of apply these uh, strategies and uh, these concepts to the uh, activity itself. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful day.